Hello, and welcome back to Classics with Katie. We are still reading Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. We left off at chapter 40. Elizabeth's impatience to acquaint Jane with what had happened could no longer be overcome, and at length, resolving to suppress every particular in which her sister was concerned, in preparing her to be surprised, she related to her the next morning the chief of the scene between Mr. Darcy and herself. Miss Bennet's astonishment was soon lessened by the strong sisterly partitionally which made any admiration of Elizabeth's appear perfectly natural, and all surprise was shortly lost in other feelings. She was sorry that Mr. Darcy should have delivered his sentiments in a manner so little suited to recommend them, but still more was she grieved for the unhappiness which her sister's refusal must have given him. His being so sure of succeeding was wrong, said she, and certainly ought not to have appeared. But consider how much it must increase his disappointment. Indeed, replied Elizabeth. I am heartily sorry for him, but he has other feelings, which will probably soon drive away his regard for me. You do not blame me, however, for refusing him? Blame you? Oh, no. But you blame me for having spoken so warmly of Wickham. No, I do not know that you were wrong in saying what you did, but you will know it when I have told you what happened the next day. She then spoke of the letter, repeating the whole of its contents as far as they concerned George with him. What a stroke was this for poor Jane, who would willingly have gone through the world without believing that so much wickedness existed in the whole race of mankind, as was here collected in one individual. Nor was Darcy's vindication, though grateful to her feelings, capable of consoling her for such discovery. Most earnestly did she labor to prove the probability of error and seek to clear one without involving the other. This will not do, said Elizabeth. You never will be able to make both of them good for anything. Take your choice, but you must be satisfied with only one. There is but such a quantity of merit between them just enough to make one good sort of man, and of late it has been shifting about pretty much. For my part, I am inclined to believe it all Mr. Darcy's, but you shall do as you choose. It was some time, however, before a smile could be extorted from Jane. I do not know when I have been more shocked, said she. Book him so very bad, it is almost past belief. And poor Mr. Darcy. Dear Lizzie, only consider what he must have suffered. Such a disappointment. And what the knowledge of your ill opinion, too. And having to relate such a thing of his sister, it is really too distressing. I am sure you must feel it so. Oh, no. My regret and compassion are all done away by seeing you so full of both. I know you will do him such ample justice. I am growing every moment more unconcerned and indifferent. Your profession makes me saving, and if you limit over him much longer, my heart will be as light as a feather. Poor Wickham, there is such an expression of goodness in his countenance, such an openness and gentleness in his manner. There certainly was some great mismanagement in the education of those two young men. One has got all the goodness, and the other all of the appearance of it. I never thought Mr. Darcy so deficient in the appearance of it as you used to do. And yet I meant to be uncommonly clever in taking so decided a dislike to him without any reason. It is such a spur to one's genius, such an opening for wit, to have a dislike of that kind. One may be continually abusive without saying anything just but one cannot be always laughing at a man with the out now and then stumbling on something witty. Lizzie, when you first read that letter, I am sure you could not treat the matter as you do now. Indeed, I could not. I was uncomfortable enough. I was very uncomfortable. I may say unhappy. And with no one to speak of it, what I felt. No Jane to comfort me. And say that I had not been so very weak and vain and non as I knew I had. Oh, how I wanted you.
How unfortunate that you should have used such very strong expressions in speaking with him to Mr. Darcy, for now they do appear wholly undeserved. Certainly. But the misfortune of speaking with bitter bitterness is a most natural consequence of the prejudice I have been encouraging. There is one point on which I want your advice. I want to be told whether I ought or ought not to make our acquaintances in general understand Wickham's character. Miss Bennet paused a little and then replied, Surely there can be no occasion for exposing him so dreadfully. What is your own opinion? That it ought not to be attempted. Mr. Darcy has not authorized me to make his communication public. On the contrary, Every particular relative to his sister was meant to be kept as much as possible to myself, and if I endeavor to undeceive people as to the rest of his conduct, who will believe me? The general prejudice against Mr. Darcy is so violent that it would be the death of half of the good people in Merrington to attempt to place him in an amiable light. I am not equal to it. Wickham will soon be gone and therefore it will not signify to anybody here what he really is. Some time hence it will be all found out, and then we may laugh at their stupidity in not knowing it before. At present, I will say nothing about it. You are quite right. To have his errors made public might ruin him forever. He is now, perhaps, sorry for what he has done, and anxious to reestablish a character. We must not make him desperate. The tumult of Elizabeth's mind was allayed by this conversation. She had got rid of two of the secrets which had weighed on her for a fortnight. It was certain of a willing listener in Jane, whenever she might wish to talk again of either. But there was still something lurking behind, of which prudence forbade the disclosure. She dared not relate the other half of Mr. Darcy's letter, nor explain to her sister how sincerely she had been valued by his friend. Here was knowledge in which no one could partake, and she was sensible that nothing less than a perfect understanding between the parties could justify her in throwing off this last encumbrance of mystery. And then, said she, if that very improbable event should ever take place, I shall merely be able to tell what Bingley may tell in a much more agreeable manner himself. The liberty of communication cannot be mine till it has lost all its value. She was now on being settled at home, at leisure to observe the real state of her sister's spirits. Jane was not happy. She still cherished a very tender affection for Bingley. Having never ever fancied herself in love before, her regard had all the warmth of first attachment, and from her age and disposition, greater steadiness than first attachments often boast. And fervently did she value his remembrance, and prefer him to every other man, that all of her good sense, and all of her attention to the feelings of her friends, were re requisite to check the indulgence of those regrets, which must have been injurious to her own health and their tranquility. Well, Lizzie, said Mrs. Bennet one day, what is your opinion now of this sad business of Jane? For my part, I am determined never to speak of it again to anybody. I told my sister Phillips so the other day, but I cannot find out that Jane saw anything of him in London. Well, he is a very undeserving young man, and... I do not suppose there's the least chance in the world of her ever getting him now. There is no talk of his coming to Netherfield again in the summer, and I have inquired of everybody, too, who is likely to know. I do not believe that he will ever live at Netherfield any more. Oh, well, it is just as he chooses. Nobody wants him to come, though I shall always say that he used my daughter extremely ill. And if I was her, I would not have put up with it. Well, my comfort is, I am sure Jane will die of a broken heart. <laughs>
and then he will be sorry for what he has done. But as Elizabeth could not receive comfort from any such expectation, she made no answer. Well, Lizzie, continued her mother soon afterwards, and so the Collinses live very comfortable, do they? Well, well, I only hope it will last. And what sort of table do they keep? Charlotte is an excellent manager, I dare say. If she is half as sharp as her mother, she is saving enough. There is nothing extravagant in their housekeeping, I dare say. No, nothing at all. A great deal of good management depend upon it. Yes, yes. They will take care not to overrun their income. They will never be distressed for money. Well, much good may it do them. And so, I suppose, they often talk of having Longbourn when your father is dead. They look upon it quite as their own, I dare say, whenever that happens. It was a subject which they could not mention before me. No, it would have been strange if they had. But I make no doubt they often talk of it between themselves. Well, if they can be easy with an estate that is not lawfully their own, so much the better. I should be ashamed of having one that was only entailed on me. Chapter 41 The first week of their return was soon gone. The second began. It was the last of the regiment's stay in Marrington, and all the young ladies in the neighborhood were drooping of haste. The dejection was almost universal. The elder Miss Bennets alone were still able to eat, drink, and sleep, and pursue the usual course of their enjoyments. Very frequently were they a reproached for this insensibility by Kitty and Lydia, whose own misery was extreme, and who could not comprehend such hard-heartedness in any of the family. Good heaven! What is to become of us? What are we to do? Would they often exclaim in the bitterness of woe. How can you be smiling so, Lizzie? Their affectionate mother shared all their grief, and she remembered what she had herself endured on a similar occasion five and twenty years ago. I am sure, said she, I cried for two days together when Colonel Miller's regiment went away. I thought I should have a broken my heart. I am sure I shall break mine, said Lydia. If one could but go to Brighton, observed Mrs. Bennet. Oh, yes, if one could but go to Brighton, but Papa is so disagreeable. A little sea bathing would set me up for ever. And my Aunt Phillips is sure it would do me a great deal of good, added Kitty. Such were the kind of lamentations resounding perpetually through the Longburn house. Elizabeth tried to be diverted by them, but all sense of pleasure was lost in shame. She felt anew the justice of Mr. Darcy's objections, and never had she before been so much disposed to pardon his interference in the views of his friend. But the gloom of Lydia's prospect was shortly cleared away, for she received an invitation from Mrs. Foster, the wife of the colonel in the regiment, to accompany her to Brighton. This invaluable friend was a very young woman and very lately married. A resemblance in good humor and good spirits had recommended her and Lydia to each other. In one of their three months' acquaintances, they had been intimate too. The rapture of Lydia on this occasion, her ador adoration of Mrs. Foster, the delight of Mrs. Bennet, and the mortification of Kitty are scarcely to be described. Wholly and inattentive to her sister's feelings, Lydia flew about the house in relentless ecstasy, calling for everyone's congratulations and laughing and talking with more violence than ever, whilst the luckless Kitty continued in the parlor, repining at her fate in terms as unreasonable as her accent was peevish. I cannot see why Mrs. Foster should not ask me as well as Lydia, said she. Though I am not her particular friend, I have just as much right to be asked as she has, and more too, for I am two years older. In vain did Elizabeth attempt to make her reasonable, and Jane to make her resigned. 
As for Elizabeth herself, this invitation was so far from exciting in her the same feelings as in her mother and Lydia, that she considered it as the death warrant for all possibility of common sense for the later, and detestable as such a step must make her were known. She could not help secretly advising her father not to let her go. She represented to him all the improperties of Lydia's general behavior, the little advantage she would derive from the friendship of such a woman as Mrs. Foster, and the probability of her being yet more imprudent with such a companion at Brighton, where the temptations much be greater must be greater than at home. He heard her attentively and then said, Lydia will never be easy till she has exposed herself in some public place or other, and we can never expect her to do it with so little expense or inconvenience to her family as under the present circumstances. If you are aware, said Elizabeth, of the very great disadvantage to us all which must arise from the public notice of Lydia's unguarded and imprudent manner, nay, which has already arisen from it, I am sure you would judge differently in the affair. Already arisen? repeated Mr. Bennet. What has she frightened away some lover of yours? Poor little Lizzie, but do not be cast down. Such squeamish use as cannot bear to be connected with a little absurdity are not worth a regret. Come, let me see the list of pitiful fellows who have been kept aloof by Lydia's folly. Indeed, you are mistaken. I have no such injuries to re resent. It is not of particular, but of general evils, which I am now complaining. Our importance, our respectability in the world must be affected by the wild violation the assurance and disdain of all restraint which mark Lydia's character. Excuse me, for I must speak plainly. If you, my dear father, will not take the trouble of checking her extravagant spirits and of teaching her that her present pursuits are not to be the business of her life, she will soon be beyond the reach of amendment. Her character will be fixed, and she will, at sixteen, be the most determined flirt that ever made herself and her family ridiculous. A flirt, too, in the worst and meanest degree of flirtation, without any attraction beyond youth in a tolerable person, and from the ignorance and emptiness of her mind, wholly unable to ward off any portion of that universal contempt which her range of admiration will excite. In this danger, Kitty is also comprehended. She will follow whatever Lydia leads. Vain, ignorant, idle, and absolutely uncontrolled. Oh, my dear father, can you suppose it possible that they will not be censored and despised wherever they are known, and that their sisters will not be often involved in the disgrace? Mr. Bennet saw that her whole heart was in the subject, and affectionately taking her hand, and said in reply, Do not make yourself uneasy, my love. Wherever you and Jane are known, you must be respected and valued, and you will not appear to less advantage of your of having a couple of, or I may say three, very silly sisters. We shall have no peace at Longbourn if Lydia does not go to Brighton. Let her go, then. Colonel Foster is a sensible man and will keep her out of any real mischief, and she is lucky to have poor to be an object of prey to anybody. At Brighton she will be of less importance, even as a common flirt, than she has been here. The officers will find women better worth their notice. Let us hope, therefore, that her being there may teach her her own insignificance. At any rate, she cannot grow many degrees worse without authorizing us to lock her up for the rest of her life. With this answer, Elizabeth was forced to 
to be content. But her own opinion continued the same, and she left him disappointed and sorry. It was not in her nature, however, to increase her vexations by dwelling on them. She was confident of having performed her duty, and to fret over unavoidable evils or argument them by anxiety was no part of her disposition. Had Lydia and her mother known of the substance of her conference with her father, their ignitation would hardly have found expression in their united volubility. In Lydia's imagination, a visit to Brighton comprised every possibility of earthly happiness. She saw, with the creative eye of fancy, the streets of that gay bathing place covered with officers. She saw herself the object of attention to tens and two scores of them at present unknown. She saw all the glories of the camp, its tents stretched forth in beautiful uniformity of lines, crowded with the young and the gay, and dazzling with scarlet, and to complete the view, she saw herself seated beneath a tent, tenderly flirting with at least six officers at once. Had she known that her sister sought to tear her from such prospects and such realities as these, what would have been her sensations? They could have been understood only by her mother, who might have felt nearly the same. Lydia's going to Brighton was all that consoled her for her melancholy conviction of her husband's never intending to go there himself. But they were entirely ignorant of what had passed, and the raptures continued with little intermission to the very day of Lydia's leaving home. Elizabeth was now to see Mr. Whipham for the last time. Having been frequently in company with him since her return, agit agitation was pretty well over, and the agitations of former partiality entirely so. She had even learned to detect in the very gentleness which had first delighted her an aff affectation and a sameness to disgust and weary. In his present behavior to herself, moreover, she had a fresh source in displeasure, for the inclination he soon testified of renewing those intentions which had marked the early part of their acquaintance and could only serve, after what had since passed, to provoke her. She lost all concern for him in finding herself thus selected as the object of such idle and proloperous gallantry. And while she steadily repressed it and could not but feel the reproof contained in his believing, that however long and for whatever cause, his attentions had been withdrawn, and her vanity would be gratified, and her preference secured at any time by the renewal. On the very last day of the regiment's remaining at Marytown, he dined with other of the offers at Longburn, and so little was Elizabeth disposed to part from him in good humor that on his making some inquiry as to the manner in which her time had passed in Hunsford, she mentioned Colonel Fitzwilliams and Mr. Darcy having both spent three weeks at Roslings and asked him if he was acquainted with the former. He looked surprised, displeased, alarmed, but with a moment's recollection and a returning smile, replied that he had formerly seen him often and after observing that he was a very gentlemanlike man, asked her how she had liked him. Her answer was warmly in his favor. With an air of indifference, he soon afterwards added, How long did you say that he was in Roslings? Nearly three weeks. And you saw him frequently? Yes, almost every day. His manners are very different from his cousin's. Yes, very different. But I think Mr. Darcy improves on acquaintance. Indeed, cried Wickham, with a look which did not escape her. And pray, may I ask? But checking himself, he added in a gayer tone, Is it in address that he improves? Has he designed to add aught of civility to his ordinary style? For I dare not hope. He continued in a lower, more serious tone, that he is improved in essentials. Oh, no, said Elizabeth. In essentials, I believe, he is very much what he ever was. While she spoke, Wickham looked as if scarcely knowing whether to rejoice over her words or to distrust their meaning. 
There was to something in her countenance which made him listen with apprehensive and anxious attention, while she added, When I said that he improved on acquaintance, I did not mean that either his mind or manners were in a state of improvement, but that from knowing him better, his disposition was better understood. Wickham's alarm now appeared in a heightened complexion and agitated look. For a few moments, he was silent. Till, shaking off his embarrassment, he turned to her again and said in a gentlest of accents, You, who so well know my feelings towards Mr. Darcy, will readily comprehend how sincerely I must rejoice that he is wise enough to assume even the appearance of what is right. His pride in that direction may be of service, if not to himself, to many others, for it must deter him from such fool misconduct as I have suffered by. I only fear that the sort of cautiousness to which you, I imagine, have been alluding is merely adopted on his visits to his aunt, of those good opinion and judgment he stands much in awe. His fear of her has always operated, I know, when they were together, and a good deal is to be imputed to his wish of forwarding a match with Miss Debro which I am certain he has very much at heart. Elizabeth could not express a smile at this, but she answered only by a slight inclination of the head. She saw that he wanted to engage her on the old subject of his grievances, and she was in no humor to indulge him. The rest of the evening passed with the appearance on his side of usual cheerfulness, but with no further attempt to distinguish Elizabeth and they parted at last with mutual civility and possibility of a mutual desire of never meeting again. When the party broke up, Lydia returned with Mrs. Foster to Meryton, from whence they were to set out early the next morning. The separation between her and her family was rather noisy than pathetic. Kitty was the only one who shed tears, but she did weep from vexation and envy. Mrs. Bennet was diffused in her good wishes for the philosophy of her daughter, and impressive in her injunctions that she would not miss the opportunity of enjoying herself as much as possible, advice which there was every reason to believe would be attended to, and in the clamorous happiness of Lydia herself in bidding farewell, the more gentle adieus of her sisters were uttered without being heard. Chapter 42 had Elizabeth's opinions been all drawn from her own family, she could not have formed a very pleasing picture of conjugal felicity or domestic comfort. Her father, captivated by youth and beauty, and that appearance of good humor which youth and beauty generally give, had married a woman whose weak understanding and liberal illiberal mind had very early in their marriage put an end to all real affection for her. Respect, esteem, and confidence had vanished forever, and all his views of domestic happiness were with overthrown. But Mr. Bennet was not of disposition to seek comfort for the dismal disappointments which his own imprudence had brought on, in any other of those pleasures which too often consoled the unfortunate of their folly or their vice. He was fond of the country and of books, and from these tastes had arisen his principal enjoyments. To his wife he was very little otherwise indebted than but as her ignorance and folly had contributed to his amusements. This is not the sort of happiness which a man would be in general wish to owe to his wife, but where other powers of entertainment was wanting, the true philosopher will derive benefit from such as are given. Elizabeth, however, had not never been blind to the improperty of her father's behavior as a husband. She had always seen it with pain, but respecting his abilities and grateful for his affectionate treatment of herself. She endeavored to forget what she could not overlook, and to vanish from her thoughts the continual breach of conjugal obligations and decorum which in exposing his wife to the con contempt of her own children was so highly irresponsible.
but she had never felt so strongly as now the disadvantage which must attend the children of so unsuitable marriage, nor even been so fully aware of the evils arising from it, so ill-judged a direction of talents. Talents, which, rightly used, might as, at least have preserved the respectability of his daughters, even if incapable of enlarging the mind of his wife. When Elizabeth had rejoiced over Wickham's departure, she found little other cause for satisfaction in the loss of the regiment. Their parties abroad were less varied than before, and at home she had a mother and sister whose constant repinings at the dullness of everything around them threw a great gloom over their domestic circle. And though Kitty might in time regain her natural degree of sense, since the disturbers of her brain were removed, her other sister, from whose disposition greater evil might be apprehended, was likely to be hardened in all of her folly and assurance by a situation of such double danger as a watering place in a camp. Upon the whole, therefore, she found what had been sometimes found before, that an event to which she had looked forward with impatient desire did not in taking place bring all the satisfaction she had promised herself. It was consequently necessary to name some other period for the commencement of actual felicity, to have some other point on which she wished her wishes and hopes might be fixed, and by again enjoying the pleasure of anticipation, console herself for the present, and prepare for another disappointment. Her tour to the lakes was now the object of her happiest thoughts. It was her best consolation for all the uncomfortable hours which the discontentedness of her mother and Kitty made inevitable, and could she have included Jane in the scheme, every part of it would have been perfect. But it is fortunate, thought she, that I have something to wish for. Were the whole arrangement complete, my disappointment would be certain. But here, by carrying with me one ceaseless source of regret, is my sister's absence. I may reasonably hope to have all my expectations of pleasure realized, and a scheme of which every part promises delight can never be successful, and general disappointment is only warded off by the deference of some little particular vexation. When Lydia went away, she promised to write very often and very immediately to her mother and Kitty, but her letters were always long expected and always very short. Those to her mother contained little else than that they were just returned from the library and where such and such officers had intended them and where she had seen such beautiful ornaments as made her quite wild and that she had a new gown or a new parcel. And while she would have described more fully, but was obliged to leave off in a violent hurley, as Mrs. Foster called her, and they were going to the camp. And from her correspondence with her sister, there was still less to be learnt, for her letters to Kitty, though rather longer, were much too full of lines under the words to be made public. After the first fortnight or three weeks of her absence, health, good humor, and cheerfulness began to reappear at Longbourn. Everything wore a happier aspect. The families who had been in town for the winter came back again, and summer finery and summer engagements arose. Mrs. Bennet was restored to her usual querulous serenity, and by the middle of June, Kitty was so much recovered as to be able to enter Meryton without tears, an event of such happy promise as to make Elizabeth hope that by the following Christmas she might be so tolerably reasonable as not to mention an officer above once a day, unless by some cruel and malicious arrangement at the war office, another regiment should be quartered in Meryton. The time fixed for the beginning of their northern tour was now fast approaching, and a fortnight only was wanting of it, when a letter arrived from Mrs. Garner, which at once delayed its commencement and curtailed its extent. Mr. Garner would be prevented by the business from setting out till a fortnight later in July, and must be in London again within a month, and as that left too short a period for them to go so far, and see so much as they had proposed, 
or at least to see with the leisure and comfort that had built on, they were obliged to give up the lakes and substitute a more contacted tour and according to the present plan were to go no further northwards than Derbyshire. In that country, county, there were enough to be seen to occupy the chief of their three weeks, and to Mrs. Gardner it had a particularly strong attraction. The town where she had formerly passed some years of her life, and where they were now to spend a few days, was probably as great an object of her curiosity as all the celebrated beauties of Matlock, Chasworth, Dovedale, or the Peak. Elizabeth was excessively disappointed. She had set her heart on seeing the lakes, and still thought there might have been time enough. But it was her business to be satisfied, and certainly her temper to be happy, and all was soon right again. With the mention of Derbyshire, there were many ideas connected. It was impossible for her to see the word without thinking of Pemberley and its owner. But surely said she, I may enter his county with impunity and rub it of a few petrified spars without his perceiving me. The period of expectation was now doub doubled. Four weeks were to pass away before her uncle and aunt's arrival, but they did pass away, and Mr. and Mrs. Garner, with their four children, did at length appear at Longbourn. The children, two girls of six and eight years old, and two younger boys were to be left under the particular care of their cousin Jane, who was the general favorite, and whose steady sense and sweetness of temper exactly adapted her for attending to them in every way, teaching them, playing with them, and loving them. The gardeners stayed only one night at Longbourn, and set off the next morning with Elizabeth in pursuit of novelty and amusement. One enjoyment was certain, that of suitableness as companions, a suitableness which comprehended health and had temper to bear inconveniences, cheerfulness to enhance every pleasure, and affection and intelligence which might supply it among themselves if they were disappointments abroad. It is not the object of this work to give a description of Derbyshire, nor of any of the remarkable places though which their route hither lay, Oxford, Benlohem, Warwick, Kenilworth, Ringingham, etc., are sufficiently known. A small part of the Derbyshire is all the present concern. To the little town of Lamberton, the scene of Mrs. Garner's former residence, in where she had lately learned that some acquaintances still remained, they bent their steps, after having seen all the principal wonders of the county, the country, and within five miles of Lamberton, Elizabeth found from her aunt that Pemberley was situated. It was not in their direct road, nor more than a mile or two out of it. In talking over their route the evening before, Mrs. Gardner expressed an inclination to see the place again. Mr. Gardner declared his willingness, and Elizabeth was applied to for her abortation. My love, should not, should not you like to see a place of which you have heard so much, said her aunt. A place, too, with which so many of your acquaintances are connected. With him passed all his youth here, there, you know. Elizabeth was distressed. She felt that she had no business at Pemberley, and was obliged to assume a disinclination for seeing it. She must own that she was tired of great houses, after going over so many, and she really had no pleasure in fine carpets or satin curtains. Mrs. Garner abused her stupidity. If it were merely a fine house, richly furnished, said she, I should not care about it myself, but the grounds are delightful, and they have some of the finest woods in the country. Elizabeth said no more, but her mind could not acquiesce. The possibility of meeting Mr. Darcy while viewing the place instantly occurred. It would be dreadful. She blessed it, the very idea and that thought it would be better to speak openly to her aunt than to run such a risk. But against this there was there were objections, and she finally resolved that it could be the last resource. If her private inquiries as to the absence of the family were unfavorably answered. Accordingly, when she retired at night, 
she asked the chamberman whether Pemberley were not a very fine place. What was the name of its proprietor? And, with no little alarm, whether the family were down for the summer. A most welcome negative followed the last question, and her alarms being now removed, she was at leisure to feel a great deal of curiosity to see the house itself herself. And when the subject was revived the next morning, and she was again applied to, could readily answer, and with a proper air of indifference, that she had not really any dislike to the scheme. To Pemberley, therefore, they were to go. Chapter 43 Elizabeth, as they drove along, watched for the first appearance of Pemberley Woods with some per perturbation, and when at length they turned in at the lodge, her spirits were in a higher flutter. The park was very large and contained great variety of ground. They entered it in one of its lowest points and drove for some time through a beautiful wood stretching over a wide extent. Elizabeth's mind was too full of conversation, but she saw and admired every remarkable spot and point of view. They gradually ascended for half a mile and then found themselves at the top of a considerable immense where the wood ceased and the eye was instantly caught by Pemberley House situated on the opposite side of the valley into which the road was some erroneous wound. It was a large, handsome stone building, standing well on a rising ground and backed by a large a ridge of high woody hills and in front a stream of some natural importance was swelled into greater, but without any artificial appearance. Its banks were neither formal nor falsely adored. Elizabeth was delighted. She had never seen a place for which nature had done more, or where natural beauty had been so little counteracted by an awkward taste. They were all of them warm in their admiration, and at that moment she felt that to be mistress of Pemberley might be something. They descended the hill and crossed the bridge and drove to the door. And while examining the nearer aspect of the house, all her apprehension of meeting its owner returned. She dreaded lest the chambermen had been mistaken. On applying to see the place, they were admitted into the hall, and Elizabeth, as they waited for the housekeeper, had leisure to wonder at her being where she was. The housekeeper came, a respectable-looking elderly woman, much less fine and more civil than she had any notion of finding her. They followed her into the dining parlor. It was a large, well-proportioned room, handsomely fitted up. Elizabeth, after slightly surveying it, went to a window to enjoy its prospect. The hill, crowned with wood, which they had descended, receiving increased abruptness from the distance with a beautiful object. Every disposition of the ground was good. And she looked at the whole scene, the river, the trees scattered on its banks, and the winding of the valley, as far as she could trace it, with delight. As they passed into the other rooms, these objects were taking different positions, but from every window there were beauties to be seen. The rooms were lofty and handsome, and their furniture situated to the fortune of their proprietor. But Elizabeth saw, with the admiration of his taste, that it was neither gaudy nor uselessly fine, with less of a splendor and more real elegance than the furniture of Rosling's. And of this play, thought she, I might have been mistress. With these rooms, I might now have been permanently acquainted. Instead of viewing them as a stranger, I might have rejoiced in them as my own, and welcomed to them as visitors my aunt and uncle. But no, reflecting herself, that could never be. My uncle and my aunt would have been lost to me. I should not have been allowed to invite them. This was a lucky recollection. It saved her from something like regret. She longed to inquire of the housekeeper whether her master was really absent, but had not courage for it. At length, however, the question was asked by her uncle, and she turned away with alarm, while Mrs. Reynolds replied that he was, adding, but we expect him tomorrow with a large party of friends. How rejoiced was Elizabeth that their own journey had not by any circumstances been delayed by a day. Her aunt now called her to look at a picture. She approached and saw the likeness of Mr. Wickham suspended, among several other miniatures, over the mantelpiece. 
Her aunt asked her, smiling, how she liked it. The housekeeper came forward and told her it was a picture of a young gentleman, the son of her late master's steward, who had been brought up by him at his own expense. He is now gone into the army, she added, but I am afraid he has turned out very wild. Mrs. Garner looked at her niece with a smile, but Elizabeth could not return it. And that, said Mrs. Reynolds, pointing to another of the miniature, is my master, and very like him. It was drawn at the same time as the other, about eight years ago. I have heard much of your master's fine person, said Mrs. Garner, looking at the picture. It is a very handsome face, but Lizzie, you can tell us whether it is like it or not. Mrs. Reynolds' respect for Elizabeth seemed to increase on this imitation of her knowing her master. Does this young lady know Mr. Darcy? Elizabeth colored and said, a little. And do you not think him a very handsome gentleman, ma'am? Yes, very handsome. I am sure I know none so handsome, but in the gallery upstairs you will see a finer, larger picture of him than this. This room was my late master's favorite room, and these miniatures are just as they used to be then. He was very fond of them. This accounted to Elizabeth for Mr. Wickham's being among them. Mrs. Reynolds then directed their attention to one of Mrs. Miss Darcy drawn when she was only eight years old. And is Miss Darcy as handsome as her brother? said Miss, Mr. Garner. Oh, yes, the handsomest young lady that ever was seen and so accomplished. She plays and sings all day long. And in the next room is a new instrument just come down for her, a present from her, my master. She comes here tomorrow with him. Mr. Gardner, whose manners were easy and pleasant, encouraged her communication this by his questions and remarks. Mrs. Reynolds, neither from pride or attachment, had evidently great pleasure in talking of her master and his sister. Is your master much at Pemberley in this the course of the year? Not so much as I would could wish, sir, but I dare say he may spend half of his time here, and Miss Darcy is always down for the summer months, except, thought Elizabeth, when she goes to Ramsgate. Is your master, if your master would marry, you might see more of him. Yes, sir, but I do not know when that will be. I do not know who is good enough for him. Mr. and Mrs. Gardner smiled, Elizabeth could not say, it is very much to his credit, I am sure, that you would, you should think so. I say no more than the truth, and that everybody will say that who knows him, replied the other. Elizabeth thought that this was going pretty far, and she listened with increasing astonishment as the housekeeper added, I have never had a cross word from him in my life, and I have known him ever since he was four years old. This was praise, for all others were extraordinary most opposite to her ideas, and that he was not a good-tempered man had been her firmest opinion. Her keenest attention was awakened, and she longed to hear more, and was grateful to her uncle for saying, There are very few people for whom so much can be said. You are lucky in having such a master. Yes, sir, I know I am. If I were to go through the world, I could not meet with a better. But I have always observed that they who are good-natured when children, are good-natured when they grow up. And he was always the sweetest-tempered, most generous-hearted boy in the world. Elizabeth almost stared at her. Can this be Mr. Darcy, thought she. His father was an excellent man, said Mr. Mrs. Gardner. Yes, madam, that he was indeed, and his son will be just like him, just as available to the poor. Elizabeth listened, wondered, and doubted. And was impatient for more. Mrs. Reynolds could interest her on no other point. She related the subjects of the pictures and dis dimensions of the room, and the price of the furniture in vain. Mr. Gardner, highly amused by the kind of family prejudice to which he attributed to her excessive comm commendation of her master, soon led again to the subject, and she dealt with energy on his many merits as they proceeded together up the great staircase. He is the best landlord and the best master, said she, that ever lived, not like the wild young men these days, who would think of nothing but themselves. There is not one of his tenants or servants, but what will give him a good name. Some people call him proud, but I am sure I never saw anything of it. To my fancy, 
it is only because he does not rattle away like other young men. In what an animal light does this place him, thought Elizabeth. This fine account of him, whispered her aunt as they walked, is not quite consistent with his behavior to your poor friend. Perhaps we might be deceived. That is not very likely. Our authority was not was too good. On reaching the spacious lobby above, they were shown into a very pretty sitting room, lately fitted up with greater elegance and lightness than the apartments below, and were informed that it was but just done to give pleasure to Miss Darcy, who had taken a liking to the room when last at Pemberley. He is certainly a good brother, said Elizabeth, as she walked towards one of the windows. Mrs. Reynolds anticipated Miss Darcy's delight when she could should enter the room. And this is always the way with him, she added. Whenever can give his sister any pleasure is sure to be done in a moment. There is nothing he would not do for her. The picture gallery and two or three of the principal bedrooms were all that remained to be shown. In the former were many good paintings, but Elizabeth knew nothing of art, and from such as had been already visible below, she had willingly turned to look at some drawings of Miss Darcy's in crayons, whose subjects were usually more interesting and also more intelligible. In the gallery there were many family portraits, but they could have little to fix the attentions of a stranger. Elizabeth walked on in quest of the only face whose features would be known to her. At last it arrested her, and she beheld a striking resemblance to Mr. Darcy, with such a smile over the, the face as she remembered to have sometimes seen when he looked at her. She stood several minutes before the picture, in earnest consultation, and returned to it again before they quitted the gallery. Mrs. Reynolds informed him that it had been taken in his father's lifetime. They were certainly at this moment, in Elizabeth's mind, a more gentle sensation towards the original than she had ever felt in the height of their acquaintance. The commendation bestowed on him by Mrs. Reynolds was of no trifling na nature. The praise is more valuable than the praise of an intelligent servant. As a brother, a landlord, a master, she considered how many people's happiness were in his guardianship, how much a pleasure or pain it was in his power to bestow, how much of good or evil must be done by him. Every idea that had been brought forward by the housekeeper was favorable to his character, and as she stood before the canvas on which he was represented and fixed his eyes upon her, herself, she thought of his regard with a deeper sentiment of gratitude than it had ever raised before, and she remembered its form and softened its improperty of expression. When all the house that was open to general inspection had been seen, they returned downstairs and, taking leave of the housekeeper, were consigned over to the gardener, who met them at the hall door. As they walked across the lawn towards the river, Elizabeth turned back to look again. Her uncle and aunt stopped also, and while the former was conjecturing as to the date of the building, the owner of it himself suddenly came forward from the road which led behind to the stables. They were within twenty yards of each other, and so abrupt was his appearance that it was impossible to avoid his sight. Their eyes instantly met, and the cheeks of each were overspread with the deepest blush. He absolutely stared, started, and for a moment seemed immovable from surprise, but shortly recovered himself and advanced towards the party and spoke to Elizabeth, if not in terms of perfect composure, at least of perfect civility. She had instinctively turned away, but stopping on his approach, received his compliments with an embarrassment impossible to be overcome. Had his first appearance or his resemblance to the picture they had just been examining been insufficient to assure the other two that they now saw Mr. Darcy, the garden's expression of surprise on beholding his master must immediately have told it. They stood a little aloof while he was talking to their niece, who had astonished and confused, scarcely dared lifting her eyes to his face, and knew not what answers she returned to his civil inquiries after her family. Amazed at the alteration of his manner since they had last parted, 
every sentence that he uttered was increasing her embarrassment and every idea of the improperty of her being found there recurring to her mind and the few minutes in which they continued together were some of the most uncomfortable of her life. Nor did he seem much more at ease when he spoke. His accent had none of its usual steadiness, and he repeated his inquiries to the time of her having left Longbourn and of her stay in Devonshire, and so often and so hurried away as plainly spoke the destruction of his thoughts. At length, every idea seemed to fail him, and after standing a few moments without saying a word, he suddenly recollected himself and took leave. The others then joined her and expressed their admiration of his figure, but Elizabeth heard not a word, and wholly engrossed by her own feelings, followed them in silence. She was overcome by shame and vexation. Her coming there was the most unfortunate and the most ill-judged thing in the world. How strange must it appear to him? In what a disgraceful light might it not strike so vain a man? It might seem as if she had purposely thrown herself in his way again. Oh, why did she come? Oh, why did he thus come a day before he was expected? Had this been only ten minutes sooner, they sh should have been beyond the reach of his discrimination. For it was plain that he was that moment arrived, that moment alighted from his horse or his carriage. She blushed again and again over the previousness of the meeting, and his behavior, so strikingly altered, what could it mean? That he should even speak to her was amazing, but to speak with such civility, to inquire after a family? Never in her life had she seen his manner so little dignified Never had he spoken with such gentleness as on his this unexpected meeting. What a contrast did it offer to his last address in Rosings Park. When he put his letter into her hand, she knew not what to think or how to account for it. They had now entered a beautiful walk by the side of the water, and every step was bringing forward a nobler fall of ground and a finer reach of the woods to which they were approaching. But it was some time before Elizabeth was sensible of any of it, and though she answered mechanically to the repeated appeals of her uncle and aunt, and seemed to direct her eyes to such objects as they pointed out, she distinguished no part of the scene. Her thoughts were all fixed on that one spot of Pemberley House, which it might be, where Mr. Darcy then was. She longed to know what it at that moment was passing in his mind, in what manner he thought of her, and whether in defense of everything she was still dear to him perhaps he had been civil only because he felt himself at ease yet there had been that in his voice which was not like ease whether he had felt more of pain or of pleasure in seeing her she could not tell but he certainly had not seen her with composure at length however the remarks of her companions on her absence of mind arose to her and she felt the necessity of appearing more like herself. They entered the woods, and biding adieu to the river for a while, ascended some of the higher grounds, when in spots where the openings of the trees gave the eye of her to wander. Were many charming views of the valley, the opposite hills, with a long range of woods overspreading many, and occasionally part of the stream. Mr. Gardner expressed a wish of going around the whole park, but feared it might be a, a beyond a walk. With a triumphant smile, they were told that it was ten miles round. It settled the manor. They pursued the accomplished accustomed circuit when brought them again after some time in a decent um, descent among hanging woods to the edge of the water in one of its narrowest parts. They crossed it by a simple bridge and a character with the general air of the scene. It was a spot less adorned than any they had yet visited, and the valley here, contacted into a glen, allowed room only for the stream and a narrow walk amidst the rough, coppice wood which bordered it. Elizabeth longed to explore its windings, but when they had crossed the bridge and perceived their distance from the house, Mrs. Garner, who was not a great walker, could go no further, and thought only of returning to the carriage as quickly as possible. 
Her niece was, therefore, obliged to sum submit, and they took their way towards the house on the opposite side of the river in the nearest direction, but their progress was slow. Mr. Garner, though solemn able to indulge the taste, was very fond of fishing. It was so much engaged in watching the occasional appearance of some trout in the water, and when talking to the man about them, that he advanced but little. Whilst wandering on in this manner, they were again surprised, and Elizabeth's astonishment was quite equal to what it had been at first, by the sight of Mr. Darcy approaching them, and at no great distance. The walk, being here less sheltered than on the other side, allowed them to see him before they met. Elizabeth, however, astonished, was at least more prepared for an interview to meet them. For a few moments, indeed, as she felt that he would probably strike into some other path, the idea lasted while a turning in the walk concealed him from their view. The turning passed, he was immediately before them. With a glance, she saw that he had lost none of his recent civility, and to intimate his politeness, the words delightful and charming, when some unlucky recollections obtruded, and she fancied that praise and primarily from her might be mischievously construed. Her color changed, and she said no more. Mrs. Garner was standing a little behind, and on her pausing, he asked her if she would do him the honor of introducing him to her friends. This was a stroke of civility for which she was quite unprepared, and she could hardly suppress a smile at his being now seeking the acquaintance of some of those very people against whom his pride had revolted in his offer to herself. What will be his surprise, thought she, when he knows who they are? He takes them now for people of fashion. The introduction, however, was immediately made, and as she named their relationship to herself, she stole a sly look at him to see how he bore it, and was not without the expectation of his decamping as fast as he could from such disgraceful companions. That he was surprised by the connection was evident. He sustained it, however, with fortitude, and so far from going away, turned back with them and entered into conversation with Mr. Garner. Elizabeth could not but be pleased, and could not but triumph. It was consoling that he should know that she had some relations for whom there were no need to blush. She listened most attentively to all that passed between them, and glorified in every expression and every sentence of her uncle, which marked his intelligence, his taste, and his good manners. The conversation soon turned upon fishing, and she heard Mr. Darcy invite him with the greatest civility to fish there as often as he chose, while he continued to in the neighborhood and offering at the same time to supply him with the fishing tackle and pointing out those parts of the stream where there were usually most sport. Mrs. Gardner, who was walking arm in arm with Elizabeth, gave her a look expressive of wonder. Elizabeth said nothing. But it gratified her exceedingly, and the compliment must be all for herself. And her astonishment, however, was extreme, and continually was she repeating, Why is he so altered? From what can be proceed? It cannot be for me. It cannot be for my sake that his manners are thus softened. My reproofs at Hunsford could not work such a change as this. It is impossible that he should still love me. After walking some time, in this way, the two ladies in front and the two ge late gentlemen behind, on resuming their places, after descending to the brink of the river for the better inspection of some curious water plant, there chanced to be a little alteration. It originated in Mrs. Garner, who, fatigued by the ex exercise of the morning, found Elizabeth's arm inadequate to her support, and consequently preferred her husband's. Mr. Darcy took her place by her niece, and they walked on together. After a short silence, the lady spoke first. She wished him to know that she had been assured by his absence before she came to the place, and accordingly began by observing that his arrival had been very unexpected. For your housekeeper, she added, informed us that you would certainly not be here till tomorrow. And indeed, before we left Blakewell, we understood that you were not immediately expected in the country. 
He acknowledged the truth of it all and said the business with his steward had occasioned his coming forward a few hours before the rest of his party with whom he had been traveling. They will join me early tomorrow, he said, and among them are some who will claim an acquaintance with you, Mr. Bingley and his sisters. Elizabeth answered only by a slight bow. Her thoughts were instantly drawn back to the time when Mr. Bingley's name had been last mentioned between them, and if she might judge him from his complexion, his mind was not very differently engaged. There is also one other person in the company, he continued after a pause, who much particularly wishes to be known to you. Will you allow me, and I do ask too much, to introduce my sister to your acquaintance during your stay at Lampleton? The surprise of such an application was great indeed. It was too great for her to know in what manner she acceded to it. She immediately felt that uh, whatever desire Miss Darcy might have been acquainted with her must be the work of her brother. And without looking further, it was satisfactory. It was gratifying to know that his resentment had not made him think it really ill of her. They now walked on in silence, each of them deep in thought. Elizabeth was not uncomfortable. That was impossible, but she was flattered and pleased. His wish of introducing his sister to her was a compliment of the highest kind. They soon outstripped the others, and when they had reached the carriage, Mr. and Mrs. Garner were half a quarter of a mile behind. He then asked her to walk into the house, but she declared herself not tired, and they soon to stood together on the lawn. At such a time, much might have said in silence was very awkward. She wanted to talk, but they seemed an embargo on every subject. At last she recollected that she had been traveling, and they talked to Matlock and Dovedale with great preference. Yet time and her aunt moved slowly, and her patience and her ideas were nearly worn out before the tete-a-tete was over. On Mr. and Mrs. Garner's coming up, they were all pressed to go into the house and take some refreshment, but this was declined, and they parted on each side with the utmost politeness. Mr. Darcy handed the ladies into the carriage, and when it was off, drove off, Elizabeth saw him walking slowly towards the house. The observations of her uncle and aunt now began and each of them pronounced him to be infinitely superior to anything they had expected. He is perfectly well-behaved, polite, and unassuming, said her uncle. There is something a little stately in him, to be sure, replied her aunt, but it is confined in his air, and it is not unbecoming. I can now say with, with the housekeeper that though some people may call him proud, I have seen nothing of it. I was never... More surprised than by his behavior to us. It was more than civil. It was really attentive, and there was no necessity for such attention. His acquaintance with Elizabeth was very trifling. To be sure, Lizzie, said her aunt, he is not so handsome as Wickham, or rather he has not Wickham's countenance, for his features are pretty perfectly good. But how come you tell me that he was so disagreeable? Elizabeth excused herself as well as she could, and said that she had liked him better when they met in Kent than before, and that she had never seen him so pleasant as this morning. But perhaps he may be a little whimsical in his civilities, replied her uncle. Your great men often are, and therefore I shall not take him at his word about fishing, as he might change his mind another day and warn me off his grounds. Elizabeth felt they had entirely mistaken his character, but said nothing. From what we have seen of him, continued Mrs. Garner, I really should not have thought that he could have behaved in so cruel a way of, by anybody as he has done to poor Wickham. He has not an ill-natured look. On the contrary, there is something pleasing about his mouth when he speaks, and there is something of a dignity in his countenance. That would not give me an unfavorable idea of his heart. But to be sure, 
the good idea who showed us the house to give him a most flattering flaming character. I could hardly help laughing out loud sometimes, but he is a liberal master, I suppose, and that, in the eye of a servant, comprehends every virtue. Elizabeth here felt herself called on to say something in invitation of his behavior to Wickham, and they therefore gave them to understand in a great guarded a manner as she could that by what she had heard from his relations in Kent and his actions were capable of a very different construction, and that his character was by no means so faulty nor Wickham so amiable as they had been considered in Hertfordshire. In confirmation of this, she related the particulars of all the peculiar transactions in which they had been connected, without actually naming her authority by stating it to be such as might be relied on. Mrs. Gardner was surprised and concerned, but as they were now approaching the scene of her former pleasures, every idea gave way to the charm of recollection, and she was too much engaged in pointing out to her husband all the interesting spots in the Everons to think of anything else. Fatigue as she had been by the morning's walk, and they had no sooner dined than she set off again in quest of her former acquaintances, and the evening was spent in the satisfaction of it of an intercourse renewed after many years' discontinuance. The occurrence of the day were too full of interest to leave Elizabeth much attention for any of those these new friends, and she could do nothing but think, and think with wonder of Mr. Darcy's civility, and above all, of his wishing her to be acquainted with his sister. Chapter 44 Elizabeth had settled it with Mr. Darcy, would bring his sister to visit her the very next day after her reaching Pemberley, and was consequently resolved not to be out of sight of the inn the whole of that morning. But her conclusion was false, for on the very next morning after their own arrival at Lamberton, these visitors came. They had been walking about the place with some of their new friends, and were just returning to the inn to dress themselves for a dining with the same family, when the sound of a carriage drew them to a window, and they saw a gentleman and lady in a curricle driving up the street. Elizabeth immediately recognized the livery and guessed what it meant, and imparted no small degree of surprise to her relations by acquainting them with the honor of which she expected. Her uncle and aunt were all in amazement, and the embarrassment of her manner as she spoke joined in the circumstance itself, and many of the circumstances of the preceding day opened to them a new idea on the business. Nothing had ever suggested it before, and they now felt that there was no other way of accounting of such attentions from such a quarter than by supposing a partiality for their niece. While they were newly born notions were by support passing in their heads, the perpetration of Elizabeth's feelings was every moment increasing. She was quite amazed by her own discomposure, but amongst other causes of disquiet, she dreaded at least the partiality of the brother should have said too much in her favor, and more than commonly anxious to please, she naturally suspected that every power of pleasing would fail her. She retreated from the window, fearing of being seen, and as she walked up and down the room, endeavoring to compose herself, and saw such looks of inquiring surprise in her uncle and aunt as made everything worse. Miss Darcy and her brother appeared, and his, this formidable introduction took place. With astonishment did Elizabeth see that her new acquaintance was at least as much embarrassed as herself. Since her being at Lambton, she had heard that Miss Darcy was exceedingly proud, but the observation of a very few minutes convinced her that she was only exceedingly shy. She found it difficult to obtain even a word from her beyond a monosyllable. symbol. Miss Darcy was tall on a larger scale than Elizabeth, and though little more than sixteen, her figure was formed, and her appearance womanly and graceful. She was less handsome than her brother, but there was sense and good humor in her face, and her manners were perfectly unassuming and gentle. Elizabeth, who had expected to find in her an acute and unembarrassed an observer as ever Mr. Darcy had been, was much relieved by discerning such different feelings. They had not been long together before Darcy told her that Bingley was also coming to wait on her. 
and she had barely time to express her satisfaction and prepare for such a visitor when Bingley's quick step was heard on the stairs, and in a moment he entered the room. All Elizabeth's anger against him had been long done away, and had she still felt any, it could hardly have stood its ground against the unaffected cruelty with which he expressed himself on seeing her again. He inquired in a friendly, though general way, after her family, and looked and spoke with the same good-humored ease that he had ever done. To Mr. and Mrs. Garner, he was scarcely a less interesting personage than to herself. They had long wished to see him. The whole party before them, indeed, excited lively attention. The suspicions which had just risen by Mr. Darcy and their niece directed their observation towards each with an earnest, though guarded, inquiry. They soon drew from those inquiries the full conviction that one of them at least knew what it was to love. Of the lady's sensations, they remained a little in doubt, but the gentleman was overflowing with admiration was evident enough. Elizabeth, on her side, had much to do. She wanted to stir in the feelings of each of her vi visitors, and she wanted to compose her own, and to make herself agreeable to all. And in the later subject, where she if feared most of to fail, she was most sure of success of those to whom she endeavored to give pleasure were prepossessed in her favor. Bingley was ready, Georgiana was eager, and Darcy determined to be pleased. In seeing Bingley, her thoughts naturally flew to her sister, and oh, how adorably did she long to know whether any of his were directed in a like manner. Sometimes she could fancy that he talked less than on former occasions, and once or twice pleased herself with the notion that, as he looked at her, he was trying to trace resemblance. But though this might be imaginary, she could not be deceived as to his behavior to Miss Darcy, who had been set up as a rival to Jane. No look appeared on either side that spoke particularly, particular regard. Nothing occurred between them that could justify the hopes of his his sister. On this point, she was soon satisfied, and two or three little circumstances occurred ere they parted, which in her anxious interpretation denoted a recollection of Jane, non-interrupted by tenderness, and a wish of saying more that might lead to the mention of her, had he dared. He observed to her at a moment when the others were talking together in a tone which had something of real regret that it was a very long time since he had pleasure of seeing her, and said, and before she could reply, he added, It is above eight months. We have not met since the 26th of November, when we were all dancing together at Netherfield. Elizabeth was pleased to find his memory so exact, and afterwards took occasion to ask her, when unattached to it by any of the rest, whether all of her sisters were at Longbourn. There were not much in the question, nor in the preceding remark, but there was a look and a manner which gave her gave them meaning. It was not often that she could turn her eyes on Mr. Darcy himself, but whenever she did catch a glimpse, she saw an expression of general compliance, and in all that he did, she heard an accent so far removed from hauntier or disdain of his companions, as convinced her that the improvement of manners which she had yesterday witness, however temporary in existence might prove, had at least outlived one day. When she saw him thus seeking the acquaintance and courting the good opinions of people with whom any intercourse a few months ago would have been a disgrace, when she saw him thus civil, and not only to herself, but to the very relations whom he had openly disdained, and recollected their last lively scene in Hunsford personage, the difference, the change was so great, and struck so forcibly on her mind, that she could hardly restrain her astonishment from being visible. Never, ever, even in the company of his dear friends in Netherfield, or his dignified relations at Rosings, had she seen him so delirious to please, so free from a self-consequence or unbending reserve as now, when no importance could result from the success of his endeavors, and when even the acquaintance of those to whom his attentions were addressed would draw down the ridicule and censure of the ladies both of Netherfield and Rosings.
Their visitors stayed with them above half an hour, and when they rose to depart, Mr. Darcy called on his sister to join him in expressing their wish to seeing Mr. and Mrs. Garner and Miss Bennet to dinner, dinner at Pemberley before they left the country. Miss Darcy, though with a diff defiance which marked her little in the habit of giving invitations, readily ob obeyed. Mrs. Garner looked at her niece, delirious of knowing how she, whom the invitation most concerned, felt disposed as to its acceptance, but Elizabeth had turned her head. Presuming, however, that this studied avoidance spoke rather a momentary embarrassment than any dislike of the proposal, and seeing in her husband, who was fond of society, a perfect willingness to accept it, she ventured to engage for her attendance in the day after the next was fixed on. Bingley's expressed great pleasure in the certainty of seeing Elizabeth again, having still a great deal to say to her and many inquiries to make after all their Hertfordshire friends. Elizabeth, constructing all of this into a wish of hearing her speak of her, her sister, was pleased, and on this account, and as well as some others, found herself when their visitors left again capable of considering the last half hour with some satisfaction, though while it was passing, the enjoyment of it had been little. Eager to be alone and fearful of inquiries or hints from her uncle and aunt, she stayed with them only long enough to hear their favorable opinions of Bingley and then hurried away to dress. But she had no reason to fear Mr. and Mrs. Garner's curiosity. It was not their wish to force her communication. It was evident that she was much better acquainted with Mr. Darcy than they had before any idea, and it was evident that he was very much in love with her, and they saw much to interest but nothing to justify inquiry. Of Mr. Darcy, it was now a matter of anxiety to think well, and as much as their acquaintance reached, they were no fault to find. They could not be untouched by his politeness, and had they drawn his character from their own feelings, his servant's report, without any reference to any other account, the circle in Heppershire to which he was known would not have recognized it for Mr. Darcy. There was now an interest, however, in believing the housekeeper, and they soon became sensible that the authority of a servant who had known him since he was four years old, and whose own manners indicated respectability, was not to be hastily rejected. Neither had anything occurred in the intelligence of their Lambton friends that could materially lessen its weight. They had nothing to accuse him of but pride, and pride he probably had, and if not, it would certainly be imputed by the inhabitants of a small market town where the family did not visit. It was acknowledged, however, that he was a liberal, liberal man and did much good among the poor. With respect to Wickham, the traveller soon found that he was not held here in much esteem, estimation, for though the chief of his concerns with the son of his patron were imperfectly understood, it was yet a well-known fact that on his quitting Derbyshire he had left many debts behind him, which Mr. Darcy afterwards discharged. As for Elizabeth, her thoughts were at Pemberley this evening more than the last in the evening, though as it passed it seemed long was not long enough to determine her feelings towards one in that mansion, and she lay awake two whole hours endeavoring to make them out. She certainly did not hate him. No hatred had vanished long ago, and she had almost as long been ashamed of ever feeling a dislike against him, and that could be so called. The respect created by the conviction of his valuable qualities though at first unwittingly admitted, had for some time ceased to be repugnant to her feelings, and it was now heightened into somewhat of a friendlier nature by the testimony so highly in his favor, and bringing forward his disposition in so amiable a light, which yesterday had procured, produced. But above all, above respect and esteem, there was a motive within her of goodwill which could not be overlooked. It was gratitude. Gratitude not merely for having once loved her, but for loving her still well enough to forgive all the pertulence and acrimony 
of her manner in rejecting him and all the unjust accusation accompanying her rejection. He who she had been persuaded would avoid her in his greatest enemy seemed on this accidental meeting most eager to preserve the acquaintance and without any indelicate display of regard or any peculiar of manner where their two selves only were concerned, was soliciting the good opinion of her friends and bent on making her known to his sister. Such a change in a man of so much pride excited not only astonishment but gratitude. For to love, errant love, it must be attributed, and as such its impression on her was of a sort to be encouraged, as by no means unpleasing though it could not be exactly defined. She respected, she received, esteemed, she was grateful to him. She felt a real interest in his welfare, and she only wanted to know how far she wished that welfare to depend upon herself, and how far it would be for the happiness of both that she could employ the power, which she, her fancy told her she still possessed of bringing on the renewal of his address. It had been settled in the evening between the aunt and the niece that such a striking civility as Miss Darcy's in coming to them on the very day of her arrival at Pemberley, for she had reached it only to be a late breakfast, ought to be intimidated, though it could not be equaled by some extortion of politeness on their side, and consequently that it would be highly expedient to wait on her at Pemberley the following morning. They were therefore to go. Elizabeth was pleased, though when she asked herself the reason, she had very little to say in reply. Mr. Garner left soon after breakfast. The fishing scheme had been renewed the next day before, and a positive engagement made of his meeting some of the gentlemen at Pemberley by noon. Thanks for joining us today. I will see you next week.